Uh, greetings from Alaska. My name is Fred Roll, uh, First Nations, Kuryong Tribe from Dillingham, Alaska. Um, starting this channel to share experiences with people, give them an Alaskan perspective. Um, there's there's a lot of encounters that happen up here, and so many go unshared. Um, for one, the ridicule. No one wants to be looked at like they're some kind of weirdo. Um, but I know for a fact there's a lot of people out there that have had experiences that were right next to me that will, will deny that experience. Um, something happens with some people, they can't just accept those things and, you know, that's not, that's on them. Um, I encourage those who have had encounters to email them in to share with everyone. Um, I have a map going up real soon of, uh, there'll be a bunch of little pin spots where there were encounters. Um, I'm trying to get it set up to where people can see the nature of the encounter, whether it be, uh, curious, uh, ran off, screamed, what have you, and, uh, get a database going for those in the know who want to know. Um, some people don't accept the topic. I, you know, I understand there's a lot of people until they put eyes on it or it screams at them, they're not going to believe. I, I get it. Uh, however, there's a, an overwhelming abundance of evidence out there. Um, this channel isn't out to prove anything to anyone. Um, I'm just here to share some things, some insight. Um, dealing with these things when you're out in the woods, it's it's very easy to get lost in that memory. And what I mean by that is there there's some people that lock it away and totally forget about it. Um, I was talking to someone just the other day about an experience they had, and I know they had it because I was there. And when I brought it up to them, they straight out was like, I haven't thought about that in 25 years, you know. So I, I know there's experiences out there that people just kind of dismissed. Um, I, I personally feel that uh, the hairy man, Sasquatch, whatever you want to call it, I feel it's dangerous. Um, I'm biased. I'll state that from the jump. Um, I, I don't think they could be trusted and... and there's reasons for that I, from my own experiences and also from others who, who have shared. I, I have some experiences I'll share here in just a moment. Um, I want people to have a better understanding of what may be going on out in the wild, whether they accept it or not. There's, uh, yeah, geez, I'll get into it. Uh, I'll start sharing some experiences so you have a better understanding of what I'm talking about. But it's all over the state. It's not just in this, you know, Alaska Triangle, um, the statewide. E even those things they're claiming going on in the Alaska Triangle, it happens all over the state. So um, there, there's little little things that go on in the mainstream entertainment where they leave some vital things out. Um, they can give the impression that it's, oh, just this area, you got to be worried. And I've had way more crazy stuff happen in Bristol Bay. Um than you know what they what they show on the, those TV shows, but anyway, um, I encourage those who have had any encounters, uh, no matter how mundane. I there's a lot of encounters people don't even realize, um, like owl hoots, crazy screams. Um, there's a multitude of different little little key factors involved. Um, one of the main things though is that scream. When one of these things is nearby and it screams at you, even if it's at 100, 200 yards, um, it, it triggers something in the mind, uh, a primal fear that uh, you, you don't even realize you have until it's turned on. And nothing I've met that was friendly ever brought on primal fear. So just food for thought if they're that friendly why why would there be something within us that automatically uh, it, it's fear-based uh, people get PTSD from it there, um, there's there's something more going on and I, I'm gonna try to explore that if possible who who knows uh, it's all speculation because at the end of the day there's no experts in this um, there are a lot of uh, 
well-versed researchers. I, I give them that. There, there's people out there really doing it and others that do it from the couch. Um, being First Nations, it's not in our culture to seek after these things. However, uh, a little later this spring, I'm going to be starting a documentary series with my little brother, and we're going to go to some areas of these encounters and, and check out some of these places. Um, one spot, there's still trees upside down with the root ball exposed. Uh, I'm really curious about those places. Um, another place is uh, there's a couple valleys back up from Port Chatham. Uh, no one goes there because that's probably where things would go down. I'm going to check that place out um, and, and a few other places where I know there's been encounters in, in recently. Um, but let me get into why I, I don't trust these things. I don't feel anyone should, but that, again, that's me. And let me, let me explain. Uh, this encounter uh, happened back in 1967 that I'm going to share with you by an elder relative of mine, uh, Elizabeth Cook, maiden name Osterhaus. Hey, cousin, if you're watching, um, I, I have her permission to use her experience. Um, I, I hope to interview her on camera at some point. There's a reunion coming up in August. Anyway, I, I digress. Um, she was telling me that the apartment they stayed in in 1967 on Unalaska Island, which is windswept barren island on the chain, on the Aleutian chain, um, there was a young native woman that had a baby that would go door to door uh, seeking help. She was a new mom or what have you, um, just seeking help with the baby, and the baby would always cry. A very distinctive baby cry. Um, one evening, her and another uh, cousin of ours, I'll, I'll have to get the name from her, um, they were in the apartment, they heard that baby crying outside. Now, these are moms, of course, they're going to start looking out. You know, they're going to want to find out why is there a baby crying out there. Well, they go out and they look around and they don't see anything. But on their way back into the apartment, there's a hairy man, you know, right there, 15 feet away. And, you know, they duck inside, they lock the door. Um, this thing was staring at them through the window. And uh, our other relative went and hid the kids in the bedroom. Um, the amount of intelligence to prey upon a mom with a, with a baby crying, that's very cunning. That's very... Uh, the creep factor is... That's crazy. Yeah, luring moms out with a baby crying, the the level of intelligence, the that cunning, it, it and because I'm biased, I'm gonna go sinister with it. Um, I don't I don't see any good from that. Was it? I mean, it's speculation, but was it luring them out to get at one of them, luring them away from the kids? Uh, in our culture, you know, you can't turn your back on the woods. You don't want to be alone in the woods and be whistling. And You know, there's all, all sorts of little little things where the hairy man will get you. Um, but for this thing to mimic a baby crying, to lure them out, there there's something above and beyond a curiosity there. Uh, you, you won't be able to convince me otherwise. How, why would it do that? Like, that, that takes some deep thought. Um, to be that overtly cunning. Um, so that, that's a very valid reason of why I feel there's, there's more going on that we can't trust. Um, uh, another example, and this just speaks to uh, just these things, mere presence, um, sparks fear. Now, outside of the shock factor, which is, I, I admit, uh, you know, it'll give you a startle like you've never had. Uh, even if you know of their existence and all of a sudden it's standing there, it's really going to grab you. Um, uh, I'm talking about the primal fear outside of that initial shock. There's there's something embedded within us that responds in that way. And yeah, fight or flight, yeah, the shock factor, sure. But above that, there there's something deeper going on that we don't even know we have it in us until it's, it's unlocked. And... Uh, Anyway, just some observations, you know, and, and like I said, I don't believe friendly things cause that. So, uh, moving on, let me, let me give you another example of what I'm talking about. 
uh, this next experience I'm going to share with you was shared with me in 1994. I recently reached out and um, two of them are relatives. I reached out and talked to them. They didn't want to be named. So we'll use, we'll just change all their names uh, just for the sake of their uh, anim anonymity. Uh, I respect that. They don't want to be put on blast like that, but they shared this experience with me. Uh, they went, there was three of them, one male, two females, uh, both females, uh, Teresa and Marty, we'll call them. Each had, uh, Teresa had a three-year-old daughter and Marty had a five-year-old son. And Mike was there to run the skiff. They had picked seagull eggs earlier that day. Uh, this was at Snake Lake. Anyone from Dillingham back home knows Snake Lake, you go back to the lake and there's seagull little island where you can go get pecked at and swooped at for some, ugh. And I, I'm not a Seagull Egg fan, so anyway. Um, from the Seagull Egg picking, they went across the lake and they wanted to check on some tundra patches where they usually pick salmon berries at the time. And they wanted to teach the kids, you know, what bushes to look for and what a learning experience for the kids. So they get back up there and this trail goes straight up uh, a little rise in between some black spruce, muskeg to the left tree line to the right and it dog legs around this little island of black spruce and the trail from that point on that little dog leg to the left it cuts uphill into thick brush and and more trees denser trees i i know the area so that's how i'm able to explain it been there um so they work along and they're teaching the kids you know it's it's taking time they're about a half hour in and as they make around that dog leg they're only like 50 yards from the skiff they can see it you know, it's, it's just right behind them. Well, they get around that corner and they notice everything is quiet. And as they're kind of looking around, they're immediately thinking bear, uh, Bristol Bay, Alaska, largest salmon return in the world. Brown bears, nine times out of 10, going to be the one causing the quiet. Um, there was no bears around as they were standing there. The little girl screamed a bloody murder and was pointing up the trail, uh, to where the brush was thicker. And they all look over, and as they look over, they notice something very big, uh, a silhouette duck into the trees. They they couldn't immediately make it out, but it was way bigger than a bear, and it was moving on two legs. So immediately, they snatch up the kids. Uh, Marty and Teresa got the kids, and they're, they're booking it. They hang to the right to go back down the trail, and something in front of them at this point. So they had the movement behind them, the dark shadow that spooked them, and then in front of them, just off to the left, where they couldn't see in the trees, the hairy man screamed at him. Um, it, he said it was piercing. He felt it in his chest, and it was on multiple octaves at once, but it, it sounded like it was standing right in front of him doing it, and they, they didn't even see it. So they're, they're, they're motivated. You know, they're hauling tail back to the skiff. Well, just things that are friendly don't do this. Um... You could say it's territorial. You could say whatever you want about it. It's still, even if you're at home up here in remote Alaska and it comes up to your house, it's still going to do the same thing. It's going to scream at you. And it's not going to be uh, there with a basket of berries. That That's just not how it is. Um, uh, and the potential down states where there's a lot more people and generational interaction, but that could be possible um, but from what I've seen up here in Alaska that's that's not the case um, that's not the case uh, another example uh, that uh, that was relatively mild they, they were just screamed at but I can imagine those moms uh, clutching their babies you know haul and tail for that skiff I, anyway it, it would be very very intense, especially if you're the mom. Um, an, another example of what I'm talking about, uh, there was four people there going up hunting, Denali Highway. Um, everyone around here knows you go up there into the alphabets, hunt caribou moose. Uh, well, they were up there, and it was one adult male and three younger males that on the verge of adulthood. Well, they were all packing it in. Uh, the dad was going to watched the fire until it burned out a little more and then he was going to go to bed well the three boys went to bed and it was just dark enough to where the firelight 
was the only thing you could see reflecting off stuff. He noticed something moving off in the distance just outside of the firelight. And he watched it, and all of a sudden, when what he was watching, he thought it was a hunter, a, a, a big, tall hunter in a ghillie suit. Um, when it stopped and looked back at him, it, was, it wasn't it was holding its foot up, but it was in a stride position. And he could see, it wasn't eye shine, but he could see the fire reflecting off of eyes. And for him to be at that distance and see the fire reflecting, those eyes had to have been pretty pretty big um so immediately it caught his attention and he focused on it for a little bit just watching it like why isn't this guy moving what does he want is he armed uh, you know standard stuff it, it is alaska well it moved from curiosity to outright fear when this thing was still like a stone statue wasn't moving uh, after three or four hours of that he, he was creeped out enough yeah he woke up the boys had them pack stuff up and they got out of Dodge. Um, again, it, peaceful campfire. Uh, these things were friendly. It had an opportunity to, I, I don't, it, he, he said the fear that came upon him was not his own doing. Um, and I don't know, he didn't elaborate much on that. But I can imagine it has to do with uh, uh, that internal that that primal receptor we have when it comes to fear when you become food and that that is not that is not a happy feeling when you feel like you're going to be food um i've been charged by bears i i've been startled and intimidated by some bears but never did i feel it was going to eat me um that's a totally different different feeling so just some food for thought. Uh, I had to make this on my phone. Hopefully I'm able to get it up. Uh, technical issues with getting internet to my house. Um, fast enough internet to upload from my laptop. I have full length videos coming soon. Um, I just wanted to give some examples of what I'm talking about up here in Alaska. And uh, documentaries are coming. And one on one interviews with uh, people in their encounters very soon as well. Um, Again, subarctic Sasquatch, or subarctic Alaska Sasquatch, let me correct that. Um, strictly Alaska-based. Uh, if you live in Alaska or have been up here and had an encounter, please feel free to share at alaskanharrymanproject at gmail.com or nocomp907 at gmail.com. Um, state in there where, please, and kind of the overall what. And uh, whether you want to remain anonymous or potentially share your uh, experience on video at some point, uh, again, Alaskan Harry Man Project at gmail.com. Uh, again, my name is Fred Roll, First Nations Alaskan. Um, I hope to give everyone a little better knowledge of what's, what's going on up here. Uh, and there's a lot more to share. I have longer videos coming very soon. All right. Thank you.